Well, good evening. Good evening. We are delighted to be with you here in Singapore this evening. This is our first trip no. to your beautiful no. island. And we have just come from the Philippines where we had some meetings there. Uh, hopped over here to Singapore and then from here we'll go on to Indonesia. So it's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I'd say good morning <laughs> because that's what time it is at home. Yes. Good morning. We could we could uh, contact our daughters and, and see them and they'd be saying good morning dad and I'll say yes good morning to you but we're about ready to go to bed now. <laughs> you know this uh, time difference can play tricks on your mind sometimes. But we are indeed delighted to be here. It's our first time in Singapore and we have loved every minute. Last night uh, Eric and Cynthia took us to the gardens of the sea and saw the lights with the music all that and today all of that area. You people are spoiled with all this beauty. So we are fascinated and have enjoyed our time here. But we're glad that we're not just tourists. That we, we're glad that we're here to be part of the training that we all have to experience in order to be more effective families in the discipleship process. In fact, when we think about discipleship, where is the first place where discipleship should take place? In fact, when Jesus said, go and make disciples, sometimes we think that we should go and make disciples, but we forget those who are at home. So we always have to keep that in mind, that discipleship begins at home. Before we begin with our conversation today, though, I like to, we'd like to introduce you to our family. Can we do that? We're proud of our family, so that's why. In fact, today we went to, a, to a, a, a mall across the street from our hotel, and they had a lot of uh, Chinese uh, artists there. And one of them was painting these beautiful pictures inside bottles from inside. And we were fascinated by them, and we said, can you do one specially for us? And so we showed him what we wanted to. In fact, this is the picture that we showed him. That's our family right there. And we asked him if he would paint a picture of this character here and this character here. <laughs> Those are our grandchildren. <laughs> so he did. We haven't told our girls that'll be their special <laughs> gift one of these days. I don't know if it'll be for their birthday I'm not, I don't even know, I don't think I can hold on to those <laughs> until Christmas anyways. Uh, I don't know about their birth, it may be their, I don't know, we'll have to figure it out, but that was a surprise for them. So this is our family, this is, uh, these are our two daughters. Uh, this is our older daughter, her name is Diana Christina, and she's an English teacher at a high school there in the state of Maryland, which is where we live. And she married Andrew almost three years ago in the state of Maryland at that time when this picture was taken uh, almost three years ago in fact they were just dating and he was in the United States Navy as an airplane mechanic but then he left the Navy but still works for the Navy as a civilian contractor now and they have those two children that's uh, that's uh, Luna is his daughter I guess and Bugsy is her son and on the other side, we have our other daughter, and her name is Hadassah, and Hadassah is a surgeon. And uh, currently, she's finishing up her residency and has a fellowship as a colorectal surgeon. In fact, she is, will be the only female colorectal surgeon on staff at the hospital in the state of Pennsylvania where she works. So that's Hadassah, and behind her is her husband named Gregory, and Gregory is a speech and language pathologist. And in front of them are their two children, and their two children are Australian. Can you tell? <laughs> Australian shepherds, their two children. And when we use the word children, we really do mean it, because they treat their babies like children. I mean. They sleep with them and everything else. <laughs> they, they really are their babies. 
So therefore they say that they are our grandchildren, but I said they don't look anything like me, so they're not my <laughs> grandchildren at all. In fact, just last week we released our latest book, our publication on grandparenting and what God has called grandparents to do. And so as I was researching all the material for our grandparenting book, I kept sending our girls little excerpts, you know, hint, hint. You know, I, I, want, I want a grandbaby that doesn't have fur <laughs> and doesn't have four legs. And they said, Mom, we get it. Stop sending us your research. But I'm still waiting. So that's our family, and now we have two bottles painted. Whoops, sorry, went back the wrong way. Two bottles painted with this character and this character there <laughs> and can hardly wait to, to give it to them and see their expression on their faces. We're anxious for that. Let's go back to uh, the time of King Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible. King Hezekiah had been sick. In fact, he had a disease that apparently was going to cause his death. But God performed a miracle. And when he told Hezekiah that he was going to perform this miracle, Hezekiah said, well, I want a sign. And he said, well, you're going to see the sun go back, the shadow of the sun go back. Remember that story? Well, he was miraculously healed, and I think the news went all over the area, and I believe that Nebuchadnezzar must have heard something about it because he sent ambassadors to King Hezekiah. And when they came to King Hezekiah's house, Remember that he showed them the treasury, the armory, but we don't read anything about his illness. He, we don't read that he said, this is what God did for me. And I think they were not just ambassadors. I think they were spies. So therefore, Nebuchadnezzar said, well, if they've got that much riches and weapons, I've got to go invade those people, and that's what happened. But then Isaiah the prophet came to Hezekiah, because he knew the ambassadors from Babylon had come. He came to Hezekiah and he asked them this very important question. What have they seen in your house? That is the question for us today. When people come to your house, what do you show them? Is a large flat screen TV the sound system, the computer, I don't know. And there's nothing wrong with those things, by the way. But what do they see in our house? What would your neighbors say? What would your friends say or your extended family if they were asked, what do you think about their home? What do you think about their family? What would they say? Would they mention material goods? Or would they see something deeper? Would they see a family that reflects Jesus? What have they seen in your house? Is the same question, like my husband said, that each of us need to ponder tonight. So we want to look just at a couple of texts and a couple of quotes to set the stage for what we're talking tonight. Here's one of those that I think is very important. Our work for Christ is to begin Look at those large letters, with the family, in the, say it with me, in the home. There is no missionary field more important than this. You see, many times we say, I can't preach like the pastor. I can't give Bible studies. Oh, that's not my gift. But do you realize that whether you like it or not, you preach a sermon every single day. You preach a sermon by the way in which you interact with your family. You preach a sermon when you're walking down the street with your child or with your spouse. The work is to begin in the family, in the home. So let's stop thinking, well, let me see, what can I do for Jesus? And we always look outside of the home. What can I do in the church? What can I do in the community? What can I do? Well, maybe I need to go as a missionary to another country. 
and we fail to realize our work for Jesus is right under our noses, right in the four walls of our own home. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8, Paul said to Timothy, if anyone does not take care of his own relatives, and we put there in parentheses his own family, especially his immediate family, he has denied the faith and is worse than what? An unbeliever. Because what kind of testimony are we giving to those who don't know about God if we ourselves are not taking care of our own family? So that's why what we want to talk about tonight is not only how we can reach people outside of the family, but how we can do it through our family, how we can do it with our, all those who are closest to us. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 29, when we don't take care of our family, what happens? Exploit or abuse your family and end up with a fist full of we, end, we may end up we may end up lonely because we don't have the closeness of the family we should enjoy. That's because we haven't cultivated that through the years. And one last uh, thought and then we'll move on. The mission of the home extends beyond out, uh, its own members. So again, not only do we take care of our own first, but then move that mission beyond the home. So we want to talk a little bit about how we can reach our neighbors, our friends, with the message of Jesus Christ, with the message of salvation. And you may be surprised to find out that we're, gonna, we're not going to tell you to go preach to them. In fact, we would tell you not to preach to them. Tell you a little bit about our neighbors. We moved to the, to the North American Division eight years ago, so we moved from the state of Minnesota to the state of Maryland, which is where the headquarters is. And for the first few months, we didn't really get to know any of our neighbors because it was the winter months. I say that because it's in the winter months, it seems like people don't want to go out of the house. Once it got a little warmer and we had to mow the lawn and things like that, then began to see some of the neighbors. And in fact, one of the first neighbors we met was the lady over here. Her name is Lizzie. Lizzie is from Cameroon. She and her husband, George, they're from Cameroon. And I got to know them a little bit and found out that she's a realtor, that they have several kids. One of them is a doctor. The other one is in college and is also an athlete. He may actually compete in the Olympics. He's that good of a runner. Then it got, got two daughters and one son who just barely started college recently. That's the first neighbor I met, and it was just a short conversation. But then I met the neighbor across the street. His name is Yazer. Yazer is a Palestinian um, Muslim, and he's got his wife and four boys, and now all four boys are married and they have kids, and they all live together, all in the same house. Yazer is a wonderful, loving man. Over there on that side is Robert and his wife and their two daughters. Uh, he's, a, he's an African-American man, very kind man. The only thing is that he likes the football team that I don't like. <laughs> so I have to tolerate his mistakes for that reason. <laughs> Next to our house, there was a man by the name of Rafiq. He was also Muslim. He was Egyptian, but they have moved to another part of the city and now rent their house. And then next to them is a Kenyan family. That's about as much as I knew about my neighbors about eight years ago. That first year at Thanksgiving time, do you know what Thanksgiving is? Okay. At Thanksgiving time, we bought a box of grapefruit at, a, at the school of the church where we attend. And we put several uh, of the grapefruit in a bag and went to every one of the houses around those with a bag of grapefruit and a card. She had to write the card because my handwriting is very bad. So she wrote in the card, we are thankful we have good friends and neighbors. That's all. We never mentioned the church. We never mentioned God. We never said anything like God bless you or anything. We just simply wanted to establish some sort of contact. So we did that. And they were very grateful and that's kind of that. You know, we would wave from a distance and all that. The second year, we did it again. 
Interestingly enough, the second year they said, oh, thank you for the fruit from last year. It took them a year to say thank you, but that's all right. And they said, we were hoping you would give us more this year, so we did. Okay. But something else happened now. Yasser brought us some cookies. A good thing, huh? And Lizzie brought us some chicken. <laughs> Thank you, Lizzie. It's okay. I'm glad no one brought us some pork. <laughs> There's some who knows a strange thing or another. But, but that was their way of saying, you give us something nice, we give you something nice. That's been happening for several years. Eight years we have been there, every year for Thanksgiving with human and fruit. Every year, a couple of them, if it's not Yazer, it's Lizzie usually. No, actually the, uh, the, palace, the um, Egyptians brought us cookies one year too. But that's the extent of that. And we think, you know, are we making any difference? But see, we never invite them to church. But three years ago, one Sabbath we were at home and Lizzie sent me a text message and she said, my mother just died. Immediately I went over to her house and they were so happy that I had come and they said, could you please have prayer with us? That's a big breakthrough. Last year, Yasser, the Palestinian Muslim across the street, he went to Palestine for a two-month vacation. I would like to have a two-month vacation. He went for two-month vacation, and when he left, he sent me a text message and said, my brother, notice the word, my brother, I'm going on vacation for two months to my homeland. Please keep an eye on my children. They see you as their father. You see, I don't know if they will ever come, back, come to church. But we have began <coughs> to establish a relationship that I hope one day will lead them to God. So if you ask us, how can we reach families for Jesus? That's the simplest answer. Be nice to them. Be friendly to them. And one thing we have always said is don't make them your targets. Just think for a moment. How would you feel if you had Jehovah's Witnesses across the hall or across the street from where you live and you knew that you were their target? They want to convert me. Don't you get defensive? Every time they say hello, I'm thinking, mm, what are they gonna tell me? What are they gonna offer me? What if they were Mormons? What if they were Muslims? What if they were Buddhists? What if they were Catholics? What if they were Baptists? And they said, I wanna convert those people, those Adventist people. You are my mission field, you're my target. How would you, how would you feel? So I think we need to change our mentality and not say, Let's target someone to make them Adventists, but rather, let's be friends with people. And if that friendship and love leads them to come to know God, all the praise and glory be to Him. If we're not the ones to guide them to God, maybe at least we have planted the seed. Sometimes we may plant the seed and later on, someone is the one that guides them to God. Does that make sense? So that's one of, kind of what we want to do tonight, is give you some thoughts as to how to help people through your life to come to know God instead of just targeting them. So with the passages and the quotes that we have learned so far, uh, we just read so far, we've learned that the family is the most important missionary field. Our own family should be our first priority. So before we start going out 
to reach others for God, let's see what we can do to make sure that those inside our home are already discipled in Jesus. In fact, tomorrow afternoon, this is just a little teaser, for tomorrow afternoon, but we're going to talk about how parents can be the disciple makers of their own children. So if you are a parent or a grandparent here tonight, make sure you come tomorrow afternoon. We're going to talk specifically about that area. Uh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this as I was telling you about Yazer, my Muslim Palestinian friend. Every year for Ramadan, I bring them a tray of food or a bag of food. I'm not Muslim, but they are. And by me sharing food with them for Ramadan, I'm saying I respect your belief. And I want to share a gift with you during a time that is special to you. So think about your friends. Think about your friends and neighbors. If they are not Christians, what time of the year may be special to them? And what do they do? Can you do something for them to say, I respect who you are. I respect your beliefs, and I want to share something with you to show you that respect. You see what, how, how that could make a difference? Instead of, I don't like your beliefs, and I want you to become like me, I'm saying, no, I respect your beliefs. I'm not, I'm not agreeing with them. That's okay. But, no, I'm respecting your beliefs, and I want to give you something to help you celebrate that way that you believe. That's one way. To so, reach families for Jesus. So principle number one is to realize that our own families, our own children, we need to disciple them. And then the second principle, the mission of the home extends beyond those family members. In other words, part of the discipling process as I disciple my children, now how do we as a family reach other members for Jesus Christ? How do we reach the family across the street? or the family down the hall. So taking that discipling to the next level. We in the, the influence of the family is more powerful, by the way, than any sermon we may preach. So one thing I'd always tell someone is don't preach to anyone unless you're a pastor. And if you're a pastor, preach, but only in church. Okay. And, and we didn't uh, mention this earlier, but the family should be well-disciplined, or really the word is well-discipled. In other words, we again need to be disciples of Jesus ourselves, and then help those in our home to be discipled as well. And look at this next statement. People around us need friendship, smiles, comfort, affection, encouragement, respect, help, gratitude, and many other, look at the next word, simple gifts. You see, if you want your family to reach another family for Jesus, it starts with relationships. It doesn't start with hitting them over the head with theology or with, with principles from the Bible or with, or with Revelation and Daniel. It starts with a smile. Something as simple as a smile. It starts with a caring attitude. And sometimes we make it so hard and we make it so difficult. We think that reaching others for Jesus is this big, elaborate process when really it's just about establishing those relationships. So we want to do something and, and maybe that will help us understand better how to do this. Are you willing to, to, um, to stand and, and mingle a little bit if we ask you to? Not, you're not going to have to come up and do anything. Don't get nervous. We're not going to embarrass you or put you on the spot. But I would like you to divide in four groups about the same number of people. So maybe one group here and maybe another one way in the back, maybe another one here, maybe another one in the middle. So can you do that just bit? Let's do it quickly. So, so what we would like you to do is to take the book of Ruth. The book of Ruth is very interesting in that it's in some ways it represents many families today, especially immigrant families. What I would like 
you to do is group one, you take chapter one of Ruth. Group two, you take chapter two of Ruth. Group three, you take chapter three of Ruth. Group four, you take chapter four of Ruth. Read it first, and that's why you need to be close together so you can hear the reading. Don't read it personally. Read it as a group. But as you read it, this is what I want you to do. Think about this family as if they had just arrived in your church. They just arrived in your church. And so as you read this story, you need to think, what is this family going through? And what are we going to do to help them? Okay? Two questions. What is this family going through? Second question, what are we going to do to help them with that situation? Does that make sense? All right. So therefore, you need to take note of the what's this family going through? And secondly, what are we going to do to help? And that is the biggest tool for discipleship. Do you care for people? This is, um, well, we make the biggest difference in our communities when we know Jesus first, listen to his voice, experience his love and care for ourselves, and then go where he leads. So one of the things that we need to understand if we're going to work with families is what is a family? Now, I'm not asking you for a sociological definition or economic definition or anything. I'm asking for a description of the family. I have just landed from planet XYZ on this earth. I just came to this earth disguised as a human being so that you wouldn't be scared. And I come to you and said, hey, uh, we have been studying the earth before we landed, but there is one concept that we're not sure we understand, and so I need you to help me understand this concept. Can you describe, notice I'm not saying define, but rather can you describe a family? I don't know what that is. We know the word, but I have no idea what it looks like. So how would you describe to me, an alien, what a family looks like? Who has an idea? A description of a family. Come on, help us out. They don't have families in Singapore, <laughs> I guess. A description. Describe a family. Now, come on. A group of people who care and love one another. So let's say uh, there's five guys that spend a lot of time together. They play football. They uh, go camping. They really have a closeness. You'd say that's a family. Okay. In some ways. In some ways. Yes. Who else? Describe a family. Simple. Don't you don't have to you don't yeah. have to think too deep. It's very simple. Not really. defined. Describe. Thank you. A father, mother, and offspring. Father, mother, and offspring. Okay. Father, mother, and offspring. So that's probably the most typical idea of a family: a husband, a wife, a father, and a mother. I shouldn't say husband and wife. A father, mother, and one, two, or. A dozen kids, depending on whether they had TV or not. I don't know. That's how they did it. So that's one picture that is that of a family. How else would you, or, or is that the only description of a family? I'm sorry. A, a grandfather, grandmother. That's a family. That's a family. Or, or what about a grandfather and grandmother who are raising their grandchildren? Right. What about <coughs> a single mom and her child? Is that a family? Yes. See, so we can't say father, mother, and children only. Mm -hmm. It may just be a mother raising their ch her, ch her children, 
or a father raising his children? What about a father with one child who marries a mother that has two children, but obviously the children are not his and his child is not hers. Are they still a family? Of course they are. We would call those a blended family. Actually, someone said to, to call them blended almost sounds like they have completed that blending, so it might be more like a blending family. They're in the process of blending until they are complete as a whole. It takes about, they say, about seven years for a blended family to actually begin to feel like a family, like a whole family. And, and it's very important, it seems so simple, but this idea is so important to understand that families today, in today's world, may look a lot different than families looked like three, four generations ago, right? There are, there are many teenage, teenage mothers with a child. That's a family. So we need to be careful with our language that we're inclusive. You know, we don't, we don't exclude, we don't exclude segments of our church or segments of our community because they don't meet our definition of families. Because sometimes we do that without even thinking about it. You know, and, and I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Let's say your church here in Singapore you're going to have a big church picnic on Sunday, this Sunday. You're going to have a big church picnic. And you stand up in church tomorrow, Sabbath. You stand up in church and say, on Sunday we're having our church picnic. And I want all of you to come and bring your children. Moms, dads, come and bring your children to our church picnic. It's a family picnic. Who have I excluded? What about, what about that widow who just lost her husband? Well, he said, you know, bring your, bring your spouse and bring your kids, and I don't have a spouse to bring. What about that single person in college who's here studying? I'm not a family, so maybe I can't come. The couple that has no children, they have chosen not to have children or can't have children, but you say, bring the children. So we have to learn to be careful with our language at church, that we don't exclude people inadvertently. If we le learn those lessons when people come to the church, they will also hear us use all that kind of careful language. So think about, picture all those families, and we could talk about all kinds of family configurations, including the five guys that play football together. Maybe they That's are. Right. Maybe that is the only family they have. Absolutely. If they came from a different country, they have no contact with anybody back home, and they can only find support among themselves. So what does the family look like? What are their needs as a family, of those, or that particular family? What support are they looking for? What would enable them to go into a church or community center and take part in their activities? And what would help them return to a church or what may drive them away? Those are questions that we should ask ourselves in every one of our churches. Are we a, fr a family friendly congregation? Let's see, I think it is working, there you go. We'll skip this one for now. So reaching families means we can be a part of their cir circle of care and influence for a longer time. Families may be more open to help and new ideas, may be more open for help and new ideas, yet when their children are very young. So if we, want, if we disciple our own children and help others disciple their children, they may be more open to being part of this family the larger family which we call the church. It's much easier to lead the children to Jesus when they are young and so children can lead the parents to. By the way, I, I don't know if you have heard that the first seven years are probably the most critical years in the life of a child. They are the character building years. They're the spiritual building years. We'll talk about those 
things tomorrow afternoon. So therefore, if we provide lots of child-friendly or children-friendly activities in the church, chances are kids will be attracted and the parents will come after them. So that's one good thing. Now, you know, and this is a very cultural thing. It changes depending on culture. But there are some churches that are very strict to the platform, only the men go, only the elders go, the services only, the, the, uh, those who serve during the worship service can only be male. Well, we immediately exclude a lot of people, and if in a culture they say, no, everybody should be included, so in that church only males go, well, then people feel excluded immediately. But again, that's cultural. In other cultures, it's the opposite. Everybody's welcome. We went to a church in New York City. It's predominantly a, a, a black church, an African-American church. Beautiful building, by the way. And we observed something very interesting at the time of the collection of the tithes and offerings. The ones who collected the tithes and offerings were young people, children. But next to them was an adult to help them in the process. So you would see these young men dressed up with tie and suit, but next to him was a deacon also dressed up with tie and suit. And as, as they were collecting the offering, the deacon would kind of step up and the child would step up. You know, that's not accidental. They were mentoring the children already. They were saying to them, your ministry, young man, young lady, is important in this church. We can't wait until they are 18, 20, or 25 before we can say, hey, would you like to help in some area of the church? We've already lost them by then. So we need to start with kids. How can we make the service one that they would love to attend? How can we help them be included in the service? Maybe they can call for the offering, have the prayers. No, they probably won't say all the wonderful words that you smart, educated, older adults can use. I hope you actually don't use all those words. But they can have a simple prayer, read a simple scripture, sing a song, so that they can buy into the value of their uh, gift to God in service. And that truly is, that was the picture of a disciple-making church. When we walked into that church, we saw that on Sabbath morning. So if you want to have a disciple-making church, let's do it in simple, practical ways. You know, teaching the children, mentoring them, involve it. Also, look what they were doing. The intergenerational, okay? The older men stepping up to the plate to mentor the younger men and the younger boys. And the same thing with the older women in the church. This intergenerational, instead of saying, we're having, you know, we do segmented ministry so much. This is just for the youth. This is just a youth ministry. This is just a, a men's ministry. Well, let's take that men's ministries group and let's make that men's ministries group active with the young men of the church and the young boys of the church. So that disciple making really is, you know, the Bible says, train a child in the way he should go, right? That means not preaching, not lecturing, not commanding, but that means taking them by the hand, walking with them, and doing it together. And that's what disciple making is all about. We will do it together. We will walk, walk the road together. You know, by the way, sometimes it, it's so simple sometimes that we forget. We've been to many, many Seventh-day Adventist churches around the world, 50 or more countries that we have visited, and just about every church we have been to will tell us we are the friendliest church in town. <laughs> and I believe they mean it. But what I've learned is that they are the friendliest church to themselves, but not necessarily to someone who doesn't belong to the church. We don't mean that, but see, I'm part of, th this is our church family. We're all members of the church, this church here tonight. I haven't seen you in a week because we're so busy. 
So the moment we walked into the church, hey, John, hi, Mary, we just start immediately gravitating to one another. That's what we love, coming to church. But what happens often is that as we are reconnecting with each other, we sometimes don't pay attention to those who don't belong here yet. And that's where I say we should not be as friendly to each other, but be very friendly to those that don't belong to the church. I remember when my wife and I went to our seminary there at Andrews University. We were a young couple. We hadn't been married even a full year. And we went to one of the smaller churches there in Berrien Springs. I don't know if any of you have ever been in Berrien Springs, but it's a very small town. And yet it's got two very large churches at that time, two very large churches, and then several smaller churches. We chose to go to one of the smaller ones, in fact, a Spanish-speaking church. So we walked into that church on Sabbath morning, and the Sabbath school superintendent saw us there sitting in the middle. He welcomed everybody and said, oh, we have a new couple. Welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Can you stand and tell us your name and where you're from and all that? So my wife and I, this young couple, stood up and I said, I'm Claudio Consuegra, my wife Pam. I'm a student at the seminary. We just came this week. Oh, welcome. We're delighted to have you. I hope you make this your home church. I said, that's, that's good. I like that. So we went there next Sabbath. Oh, we have a new couple here this morning. Welcome. Glad to have you here. Please stand up and tell us your name, where you're from. I thought, well, maybe this person wasn't there last week because he was a different superintendent. <laughs> Hi, I'm Claudio Consuegra, my wife, Pam. I'm a student at the seminary. Welcome. We hope you make this your home church. Third week. <laughs> we have a new couple here in church this morning. At the end of that service, I went and talked to the pastor who was a friend of mine. I said, hey, would you mind if next week I stand at the door of the church and welcome your members? He thought, that's kind of strange, but sure, you want to do it. Here, I was the new member or the newcomer, and I was standing at the door welcoming the members because obviously they didn't know who we were. It's so important that you pay attention to people that you learn their names, that, the, that the, the second time you see them, you will go to them and make them feel welcome. That doesn't take that much work. When I was a pastor, if someone came to my church the first day, I would welcome them. But if they came, home the, if they came to church the second time, I would be at their door that Monday. And they joined the church. Guess why? First pastor ever came to see me. That's what they would say so often. So pay attention to the people. That's all we're saying. You will gain a lot of friends and a lot of church members. In addition to paying attention and just, just noticing and welcoming, let's be careful not to be too critical. Remember, discipleship is a process. It's a process of growth. So when new people come or as we start to establish those relationships, let's not be critical if they're not where we think they should be in their spiritual walk. You know, I was sitting in a, in a church and this one teenager was collecting the offering. Praise God? Right, praise God, I said. This teenage young man was collecting the offering that Sabbath. And as he walked down front to collect the offering, you know, I don't know about here in Singapore, but in the United States, some of our teenagers wear their pants really low, <laughs> you know? And, and this, this teenager had his pants really low and he didn't have on a suit, he didn't have on a tie, he was honestly dressed like a typical teenager would. And this dear brother behind me said, that as this teenager went down the aisle and, and came back up collecting all the offering, smiling, this older gentleman said, next time you come, dress properly. You know, and I just, I just cringed because I thought, he may not come back. 
Sometimes it only takes one critical word and they won't come back. So I whispered to the gentleman, I said, but praise God he's in church this morning, right, brother? You know, it's so easy for us to criticize other people. But let's look for what they're doing right. Let's look for opportunities to celebrate the good, to affirm them in their baby steps, maybe, that they're taking, instead of criticizing them because they're not where we want them to be. By the way, there was some uh, research done in the 90s, Christianity Today published it, of a lady that went to a number of churches in California to find out what made them good or not. And she gave scores to a number of activities and found out interesting facts. For instance, what would you think is, what, when, when someone comes into the church for the first time, what would you think is one of the first things they need to know? I, I heard someone say it. Where's the restroom? Absolutely. They don't come saying, got it. I wonder what they believe, what are their doctrines, you know, all that stuff. like. I want to know where the bathroom is because if I need it, I don't want to have to ask anyone. So where's the restroom? Secondly, who's the pastor or who's in charge here? Simple things. And so one of the things she said was, if we give scores again, for churches, I would say, uh, welcome. Good to see you. My name is Claudio. You are? My name is Supri. Super, so glad to have you. Hey, have you here? I don't think you've been here before. I don't recognize you. So this is your first time? It is the first Welcome. time. Welcome. You know what? I'd like you to meet my pastor. Come on. Just come on up and meet my pastor here. Pastor, look, we have a visitor. Super is here. Oh, Super, good to see you. Good to see you. <laughs> yes. It's the first time he comes I to see, see you. I see your first time. Yes. yes, yes. Pastor. We like him. He's a good man. By the way, Super. If you ever need to, the restroom is over back there on that side. <laughs> and, and, and I see you have some kids. Let me show you where the Sabbath school classrooms are. It's simple. Thank you, Super. It's simple, simple guidance so they don't feel so lost. How many of you were not born or raised in the, in the Seventh-day Adventist church? A few of you. I was born and raised Catholic, joined the church when I was about 18. It's not easy coming into an Adventist church sometimes. It, for us it is, because we're so familiar with everything. But when you come into an Adventist church and you hear some terminology, you know, Andrews. Hey, did you go to Andrews? No, I went to PUC. What is that? Is that some sort of store? You know? What, what is that? You know, Dr. Orothai, uh, Kurosan, who's our family ministry director for this division, SSD, was telling me that when she went to Spicer, what Spicer? It's where you put spice and a little bit more spice? You know, this is not hot enough. You need to spice her. You know, is that what that means? No. She went to a Spicer college in India because she is from Thailand. She didn't speak English. And so she went to Spicer college. And one of the professors, the class that she was taking, uh, was very heavy into one of our main authors in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, one of the pioneers. Her name is Ellen G. White. But because of his accent, all that Orothai could, could hear is yellow and white. <laughs> so she asked a friend, why do we have to do everything in yellow and white? She said, what do you mean? She said, well, teacher said yellow and white, yellow and white. He said, no, 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 he's saying Ellen G. White. It's like we speak a different language. So we have to normalize our vocabulary as Adventists in order to help people understand who we are and what we believe and how we can help them. So make families feel welcome, safe, and happy. Consider their needs and provide for them. Give them opportunities to connect with other families. And by the way, it's not enough to invite them to lunch at the church. What would really be better is to invite them to your home. Not just after church, but maybe Tuesday or whatever day of the week. Come over to the house. 
Let's spend time with them. Let's make him feel welcome and loved. Make their lives easier in some ways. Is there something that I can do to help? When someone dies, by the way, it's okay to say, I'm sorry, obviously. It's good to be with them. But sometimes simple things like, let me wash dishes. Let me, uh, well, you don't have too many lawns around here, I guess, so you wouldn't mow the lawn in their house, but uh, <laughs> let me sweep the floor. You know, let me polish your shoes. Let me iron your shirt. Sometimes very simple, practical things can be very helpful, helpful to someone whose loved one has died and their mind is so full of thoughts and ideas that simple things can be very helpful. Consider the time of your event. So how do you reach families? What do families in your community need? Think about those things. Actually, I want to move to, to, uh, to this. Uh, I want to move through a lot of things here quickly just because I want to get to a couple of things here. Uh, maybe I shouldn't go that fast after all. So there's a three-track approach, kind of a, the seeker track is uh, how do we become family-friendly in our services, and we talked about that. I don't want to go through that again. The teaching track or the disciple-making track is where you begin by making friends, but then you transition to offering the possibility of learning about Christ. When I was a young man, 17 years old is when I went to the United States from my homeland of Colombia, and I, you know, was not interested in faith or church. I was a Catholic, and Catholics, we just simply went to church whenever we got a chance, that's it. But the people that I met in the Pacific were all Adventists. They were my cousin's friends. They all happened to be Colombians, so that's how we make the connection with our nationality. And it was interesting because they invited me to church on Sabbath, and no, 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 that's, that's good for you. That's fine for you, but I'm Catholic, remember that. Oh, good. So then they would say, hey, we'll go to church on Sabbath morning, but then in the afternoon, we're going to go to such and such a place, a park sometimes. They would go on a hike. You want to go with us? Oh, a hike I can do. Go to the park I can do. So I would go with them, and we would play games and sing songs and have a good time. But it's interesting that about an hour before sundown, they would say, oh, We've got to go to church. I said, church? You had church this morning already. Why are you going to church in the afternoon? Well, that's where we have our young people's meeting. AY or MV, whatever. AY, I guess is what it's called, right? You have AY here? No, Adventist Youth Society? Sabbath evening. No. So I said, okay, you guys go to your church. You take me home. But as we were going by the church, they would say, oh, man, I'm sorry. We're running late. You mind going with us? Well, I was having a good time with them, so I said, okay, fine. I'll just sit and listen to your singing and stuff that you do for that. By the way, this is how, how wonderful God is. The first day, the first time that I attended their AY meetings, one of these young people came with a poster that had a horn with a face on it. And I said, boy, that, what is that, some sort of modern art? And she says, no, that's the Pope. <laughs> and you want me to become an Adventist when you're attacking my Pope, painting him as a horn? So we have to be careful. Have to be careful. Anyways, as I started going to AY, little by little, I was listening to things here and there, and eventually... God, God got my heart, and I became a Seventh-day Adventist. How did it happen? By becoming friendly with me. That's how I joined the church. If you want to do an evangelistic meeting, however, and want to do it with the family in mind, instead of that, just doing prophecies and beasts, which are all good, but maybe use the family as the basics of it, one of our colleagues there in North America, Dr. Alonzo Smith, who's now uh, the executive secretary for a conference, Greater New York Conference, is an evangelist, but also a family ministries director. He wrote an evangelistic series called 
sermons that strengthen families. So maybe you could do that over Wednesday nights, or you can do it over however many evenings. But so it's not it's doctrinal sermons, but they are based on the family. That's one approach. But here's the third uh, part of the track, and it's what happens when people join the church, but then they leave the church. Does that ever happen when, to you when you have people join the church through baptism after an evangelistic meeting, and then three or six months later, they're gone? It's, and then you said, see, that's why public evangelism doesn't work. People just don't stay in the church. It's not that public evangelism doesn't work. It's that we don't work. Again, we haven't befriended them. So we created this particular program called Welcome to the Family to retain members of the church, or new members in the church. This is another book that we wrote, and uh, your director will have all of these. We'll have the e-files for all of these. And we'll talk more about this one tomorrow, but we wrote this book for parents to disciple their children. So when children say, I want to be baptized, what do we usually do? We take them to the pastor and say, Pastor, Johnny wants to be baptized. Will you prepare him for baptism? And we think that God has called each of us as parents to be the disciple makers of our own children. So we wrote this book for parents to go through with their child to prepare their own child for baptism. We can go ahead and flip to the next one. And then... Uh, <coughs> The other part is discipling. This is one of the newest books that we wrote. It's on grandparenting. It's called Grandparenting, Giving Our Grandchildren a Grand View of God. So it talks about the responsibility of Christian grandparenting, and it talks about those grandparents in the Bible, such as Lois, that give us a wonderful description of, of how we can do that. We're just sharing this with you, so if you wish to use them. We don't get royalties from any of these things because we wrote them while working for the NAV, working for the church. So we're not telling you this so you can buy them and we can retire early or something like that. Okay. That's why we said we're sending them to your director. If you can publish them here, publish them, use them. The point is there are resources out there to use the family as your evangelistic tool to reach people. That's the, the point that we're trying to make. There's a, this one also, we, we uh, wrote it for discipleship prop, uh, purposes. It's called A Follower of Jesus, and it's really to help the new people coming into the church. Instead of taking them to a Sabbath, traditional Sabbath school class where people get into fights and arguments. Oh, I guess it happens here too, huh? You take them to a separate class where they can continue in their discipleship process until they are a little bit more mature then organize a Sabbath school class just with them. Because remember, they are more open to welcome new members anyways than we who have been in the church for a long, a long time are. And by the way, this is separate from this, but the, the next quarter Sabbath school lesson for adults, not this quarter, but next one starting April, May, and not starting, but April, May, and June quarter will be on the family. The title is Family, uh, family Seasons. And we know the authors, they are good people. Well, actually, we wrote it, so, <laughs> so it's self-promotional there. <laughs> no, we had the honor to, to uh, be asked to write the Sabbath School lesson for next quarter, so when you read it, you'll at least remember the faces that, uh, that put those lessons together. You know, our time is up, but I think basically we want you to understand that we can disciple, first of all, our own families, our own children, but we can also use our families as an evangelistic outreach to others. We don't have to have a big evangelistic program in the church to win others for Jesus. We can do it with our own families. And I would say the same thing. We could have a list of things that you could do, the techniques that the evangelist might tell you to use, what we, do, what we would say to you is be loving, be friendly, be warm to people, be genuine with people. You don't have to be perfect. But that would reach people more than anything else you can possibly do. Just simply be kind, loving, and friendly to them. 
think of ways that you can be kind, loving, and friendly to people, and you'll see how the, how the family will grow. About two and a half minutes. Any questions, any specifics that you would like us to answer? We're going to let um, Cynthia, you can give them details about tomorrow because I don't know where to tell them to join us tomorrow. I don't know the name of the church, but you do. So anyone has any questions now? Anyone? Do you have any questions to ask them? Lock them well, up until they turn 21. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, that's hard for me to answer in a, in, a couple, in a couple minutes, but I will tell you this. We do have a book on teenagers that we wrote and how to reach teenagers for Jesus. And, but we talk in there about the importance of just continuing to pray for our kids. And how do we help our children? You know, there's another whole session on how do we move our kids from faith of their fathers to their faith. You know, when they were little, they go to church because we tell them to get up and go to church, and, but then through the teenage years, and when they get 17, 18, 19, 20, they get to the point where they have to make the decision for themselves to follow Jesus. And what does that look like? And we talk about all of that in there too. Um, I don't know, that's just really hard to answer. In a no, minutes. I'll give you some more specifics in this way. When I was working in my master's program, my, one of my professors used to say this, and I want you to remember this word, this is for everybody. Positive attention is better than negative attention. But negative attention is better than no attention at all. And that goes for teenagers, that goes for little children. So what happens? Any time that you don't pay, that you don't give positive attention, attention to your children, they will misbehave in order to ask for attention. So what happens? You yell at them, you chastise them, you punish them, you send them to the room, you're giving them negative attention, but that's better than no attention at all. It works for little kids, it works for teenagers. So this is what I'm saying. If whenever your child is talking to you, the phone rings and you answer it, you're giving them negative attention and they rebel. So part of changing our kids, including teenagers, is giving them the time and positive attention that they desperately crave. But in our busy society, we would rather have the time for ourselves and their attention only when it's convenient to us. So I think a life-changing thing that we can do for our teenagers and our children in general is disconnect in order to connect. And I don't mean just the phone, but the computer, television, whatever other thing that we're doing. Give our kids good quality time. I don't know if you ever heard of a, a, a singer whose name I can't remember. Have you ever heard of him? Cat Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> No, not Cat Stevens. Uh, anyways, uh, maybe you remember the the the, uh, the singer. He wrote. He, he sang a song in the '60s called "Cats and Cradle." Anyways, the song basically says, "My child arrived just the other day." My child arrived just the other day. <laughs> he learned to walk while I was away. But there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And then he says that, that, that he would say to his child, we'll get together. Then the child grew up and says, Dad, let's play ball. And Dad would say, I don't have time right now, but we'll get together then. When the kid went to college and came back home, he says, the, the father says, son, let's spend some time. And he says, Dad, I would love to do it, but what I really need now is the car keys. Can I have them, please? But we'll get together then, Dad. Now I'm old, my children have moved away, 
and I would love to hear from them, but when I call them, they're too busy with their children, they are sick, and they say, but don't worry, Dad, we'll get together then. What I'm saying is, if we don't spend time with our kids now, don't be surprised if they don't want to spend time with you then. Positive attention is better than negative attention, but negative attention is better than no attention at all. So in fact, when I see kids with spiked hair or all kinds of um, earrings and paintings and tattoos and the pants bag, I don't think they're being rebellious. I think they're craving the attention that they don't have. That's what I would say the best solution is give them all the time and attention you possibly can. There is very strong research that shows about the importance of family dinner. Families that sit together to dinner, not in front of the TV with a TV tray or not, no, sitting together to dinner at least five nights a week, they show the, the, uh, the number of teenage pregnancies go down, the um, incidence of depression, drug abuse, and suicide among young men go down. Just by sitting down together as a, as a family to eat dinner at least five nights a week. So again, we, co- we talk about time and something as simple as dinner. Why is that important? Because it is the time when we get to share, talk, and listen. But here's the key to it. Again, get rid of these things while you're having dinner. Because if you're having dinner and your son is telling you about the conflict that he had in school and the phone rings and you answer it, what you're saying to him is, I don't care about you as much as I care about the person that's calling me. You're not as important as the person that's calling me. So whenever it's time for dinner, put the phones in a different room. You know one of the things that some people are doing now when they go to a restaurant, have you seen people sitting at a table and everyone's got their phone on and looking at it? So some people have decided that whenever they go to dinner someplace, they'll put all their cell phones face down, one on top of the other. If a phone rings, whoever reaches to answer has to pay the bill for everybody. <laughs> it's to, we have to be retrained to be sociable. So be sociable with your kids, eat dinner with your kids, pray with them, give them the attention that they need. Thank you, Cindy. Yeah.